Welcome to another episode coming at you from ChooseYourRelationships.com, author of Love Can't Wait, which can be found on Amazon.com. Today, I have a special guest. She's an integrated therapist. She's a certified divorce mediator, certified strategic intervention coach, graduate of energy and intuitive science, lifelong study of psychology, human sexuality, and universal principles, speaker and workshop facilitator for medical and mental health professionals, and has contributed to two wellness programs for Fortune 500 companies. She also has a new book coming out called Feeling Like Your Marriage is Dead, How to Create Love for a Lifetime. And she has a podcast that I really like called The Love Shack Live, helping couples rescue their relationships. My special guest today is Stacey Bartley. Welcome to the show. Oh, Sharp, it's great to be here. I've been really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so thank you so much for allowing me to participate and contribute to your listeners. I really appreciate that. Yeah, same here. So so where are you from originally? Well, so I, I was born and raised in the wonderful state of Utah. And I know um, the minute I say that, people go, is she Mormon? And the answer yeah. is, yeah, I was. <laughs> I was born and raised in the um, LDS faith and the Mormon religion. And that's hence why I also have six children. I just need you to know I was on my way to the promised land. <laughs> okay, so I was doing my part, people. <laughs> I'm currently living in Northern California, Sacramento to be exact, with my husband, Tom. And we have eight kids together. He has two. And of course, I brought the big package along with the, the six incredible kids. And we're just expecting number 13 grandchild. So we call this a party in a box. Yeah, party in a box over here, right? It's, the party starts when we show up and it ends when we leave. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get started? I mean, on this journey? Because I know everyone has a different path, a different start. And, you know, I don't think that you were, you know, you were a young woman, you know, in college or in school. And you said, you know what? I want to be a relationship relationship expert. You know, I don't <laughs> think that was the case. Correct <laughs> me if I'm wrong. No. Well said, Sharp. As um as life takes its twists and turns, right? Um there's a, a wonderful quote that illustrates this beautifully that says there are two days in a person's life that are celebrated the most. The, the first day is when they're born and the second day is when they discover why. And that it is both our journeys, right? Um, and that was certainly my case. Um, I didn't, I, I did go to college. I did a lot of college, but not in the traditional way because I fooled around and got pregnant at the age of 17 with my high school sweetheart. And so time I was 18 years old, I was married and had a house and a, and a, a daughter and um, 19, I divorced. And by the time I was 20, I was married again. I was going to do it right this time, according to my religion. And I was expecting baby number two. Um, so I really thought in my life journey that I was just going to be the best mom out there. And that was kind of the paradigm that I was raised in. That's what a good Mormon girl does. And at this point in time, um, I had a lot of shame and self beat up about what I had just put me and my family through by getting pregnant outside of the religion. That is not, if you, <laughs> you're wondering, that's not a tenant. You don't have sex before, you know, marriage in that paradigm. It is in many. And so I'd really blown that to heck in a handbasket. So I was trying to pay penance and repent um, for my second round and I was going to get it perfect and I was going to check all the boxes and be the best mom and best wife and we were going to do, you know, the tea of getting to the temple and praying and prayer and, and all the things you got to do so that I could somehow redeem myself from this experience. Um, only to find myself 13 years later um, depressed and shut down and struggling with life. And, and I was really hard on my husband because, you know, it had to be perfect. Mm. I just, <laughs> so I was probably a really big pain in the ass, really. Um, and I come to find out he started kind of going out and, and drinking and coping in ways that were also not true to our religion. And I, I felt like my whole eternal family that I was dedicating my life to was spinning out of control. And 
um, finally that ended. And that was the moment where you asked me the question, how did you start to do what you do? And that was then when really I was just trying to figure myself out. I was trying to put my own wills on and, and say, okay, I checked all the boxes that I was told to check about marriage and creating long, sustaining, lasting love. Okay, that didn't work. Like that didn't take, I mean, and I felt kind of betrayed. I felt betrayed by my, my religion and, and what I was taught and all the principles and precepts that I was told were going to make for a really great life and a sustaining relationship. And um, because I did them, I did them to the T and then it didn't work. And so then it's kind of like you have this experience as many of us do in our late thirties and forties um, of my foundation being crumbled. And I had to go back and kind of decide, okay, this worked. I believe in this. This is true for me. And I got to throw this out. I got to be done with this. This doesn't serve me anymore. And that that took many years for me to, to put together. So that's basically how I became a relationship um, person um, with all of his twists and turns. I got into therapy. I stepped out of therapy, thought I was going to be a doctor, started um, attending, you know, a nurse practitioner uh, nursing school. So I learned a lot about the body and and I loved it. I, and then I got pregnant and the whole, the whole story continues as it's a weaving journey. Um, I became a divorce mediator before I became a relationship person and thought, this is, I love that work, but gosh, people need help on the front side, not just the back side. Um, and as the story goes, it wove me to the place that I'm at now. Um, and I ended up meeting my husband and a lot of it, a lot of the final pieces ironically came together when I was terrified of falling in love again. And I had been 15 years raising my family after my second divorce. Um, I had I spent a lot of time and, and like so many of us do say, you know, screw that love thing. I ain't doing that again. <laughs> right. I'm an independent woman. I don't need no man. Yeah. <laughs> Hell with that. And I spent 15 years being true to that until I met my husband. And we can dive into that whole story if you want to. But yeah, in true. a nutshell, that's that's kind of what happened. Um and so the frameworks a lot that I of for the frameworks that I use in my work right now were born out of my own desperation and need. <laughs> and then confirmed and validated by science and traditional college and learning and those kinds of things. So um, I'm not quite sure what part of the journey I want to jump into at this oh, point. No, I, yeah, what, 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 which part piqued your interest? And we can what, do what well, what's a divorce mediator? So a divorce mediator, a lot of people don't realize that mediation for divorce is available. Um, and it's the step before you lawyer up. Oh, okay. So we take you through the same process of getting a divorce. But the thing that's really cool about mediation is that the couple gets to make all of the agreements inside of the contract or the, shall we, shall we say, the resolution plan. And so the mediator helps to have those conversations and guides them through the divorce process. So you can do what's best for your family instead of allowing a judge to do that for you. Oh, uh, typically how it's done is you lawyer up and, and then, you know, you basically go to for the judge and he says, okay, you're going to get this and you're going to do that. And this is how it's going to roll with the kids. With mediation, you can define that for yourselves between the two of you. Um, as long as the both of you agree. So I highly recommend that to any of your listeners. If you are in the process of knowing that you are heading that way in a relationship, it's such a more gentle, supported process. In fact, I, I coined a phrase, a loving release, and that's not an oxymoron, but it's, it's when you come through that divorce, it doesn't have to be this knockdown drag out, which is typically what happens when we lawyer up because the lawyer is representing your interests only and they're getting out out of the situation, what is, you know, you can get out of it, not what's necessarily best for the whole or the family, which yeah. is the goal of mediation. We want the whole family, the whole person to go forward in a good way. Everybody deserves a new start. And that's what I love about it. Yeah, that sounds better than the, 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 the lawyers taking off. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, and here's the thing. You have nothing to lose because if it goes sideways, you're going to lawyer up anyway. That's your next yeah. step. Right. So yeah. if the communication is so broken down and you're really wanting to give somebody the screws that bad that you want to take it that far, there is the legal process where everybody can lawyer up. Um, yeah. But, man, if you don't have to go that way, 
Oh man, don't do it. It's it's yeah. not pretty. I always say when somebody pays, everybody pays. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so do you recommend people um take some sort of therapy before they get married? Mm -hmm. Yes, and and I recommend that um even long before marriage, um you do some kind of a therapy and and therapy kind of has like this Debbie Downer yeah. like feel to Ooh, it. Like, Ooh. man, if I got yeah, 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 if I gotta do therapy, yeah. there must be I must be really screwed up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how did how did that happen, you think? How did that happen? Oh, um, because we had a lot of judgment and finger pointing way back in the day about people who were mentally challenged and couldn't figure life out and couldn't be successful. And so we would label them all kinds of things historically. And it goes as far back as you know, in study of civilizations, the 10th, 11th, and even 12th century. So it's just kind of this silly narrative that's carried on. And I think as we're evolving and transforming as human beings, that's starting to kind of, we're, we're starting to realize that's just a bunch of BS. Yeah, exactly. Here's the thing about therapy. Um, in my world, if we're going to be good lovers, then we need to get good at loving. Yeah. Just as if I wanted to be a race car driver or I wanted to be an entrepreneur or I wanted to be a good chef, I know that I would have to learn some skills and not only learning them, but practice them a lot before I gain a mastery. And love and relationships is no different than that. If we want okay. to be good lovers, we must love and practice. And guess what? Just like all of those journeys I just mentioned, it's going to be messy. You're like, you are going to so screw this up because yeah. we don't know what we don't know. So we're going to get better at it as we go. And unfortunately for most of us, we start relationships and have this expectation and our idea about how it's supposed to go. And when it doesn't go that way, we make a, a, all kinds of crappy, awful, horrible stories about who we are, about who other people are and about relationships and love itself. So we never allow ourselves to go again, which just ensures that you're going to continue to be a crappy lover for the rest of your life. Right. Um, opposed to saying, okay, what can I learn here? And so we need to study relationships at least as much as like driving a car or making a batch of cookies, for God's sakes. Like, we have to study this stuff. And if we want to call it therapy, great. But I just want to encourage everybody, get some education about how relationships work and the skills that are necessary to navigate it. And what that means is you're going to have to do some reflection, yes, inside of yourself. But also there's a tremendous amount of aha moments without hashing problems when we understand just how this plays out human behavior wise, right? How do we create connection? Why is intimacy so hard? Why is it difficult to be vulnerable? There are answers for all of these questions, right? And when we understand the answers, it doesn't seem so scary anymore. So yeah. relationships seem to be like this, ooh, gosh, don't go there. Don't open the closet. <laughs> no, open the closet. That's where all the good stuff lives. <laughs> yeah. I always say, you know, the same energy you put into that job or your career, Take that same energy and put it in your relationship and see what happens. <laughs> I love that. And then I would say to you, but how do I do that? I'm, I'm terrified. I don't know what to do. And every time I step up and I try, I go, oh, man, I can't be successful here. And I make up a whole bunch of things about why that's the case. And so I give up again. Right. It's it's not like you get a coach for for business or um, a coach for creating a great show or podcast. And they say, OK, do this and then do this and do this. And if we think about any journey in the beginning, we were like, what? What? Oh, my gosh, I'm so scared. I don't know. <sighs> <sighs> and then if you have somebody that's saying, OK, no, you got this. Yeah. Okay. Oh, here's where you need to tweak that. Right. OK, now go again. Try again. You know, um, we can be successful at that. Yeah as we practice. So yeah. you've got to tell me what to do because all I know is what I've been taught and I will do what I know to do until I know differently, which is hence why, okay, we know we need to spend time. We know that we need to talk. We know that we have these emotions or these feelings as a byproduct of being in love. Like there's no more of an emotional journey than a relationship. Like that, that is, is about as emotional and touchy feely as it gets. And on the front side, 
when I'm all excited to get in, I love that part. And then when all of my problems come up and all of the things that are not working for me start to pop up, I don't know how to talk about them. Like, I don't have yeah. any resourcing for that. And what yeah. I have been taught to do, what what have we been taught to do? We're get all away. really good at it. Get the hell out of Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> we shut down and then we go to this old good fashioned old fashioned skill of if I don't say anything, it's gonna go okay. <laughs> or the other favorite is just go along with what they want. And yeah. It's gonna be fine, right? Because we're like, please, please, please work out. <laughs> yeah. That's usually what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and then when that blows up, right, then we don't know what the heck to do, right? So yeah. it's safer to hide in the closet. I get it. Yeah. I, right? I, I don't make me come out. Don't make me talk. Don't make me go there. Because I say the wrong things. Or you take it the wrong way. And now what do I do? I'm lost. I'm at a loss. Yeah. How how did you um, get over that, um, I guess, that hurdle of, hey, you've been, you've been married a couple of uh, a couple of times early and then your husband now comes along. How do you, and you know, some people be like, eh, I don't know, man, you know, you, he, he's a, you're a great guy and everything, but I don't know. How, how did you mentally get over that mm. or get past that or break through that? Well, Sharp, that's a really good question. And, and I want you to know that I'm no different than your listeners out there. I kicked my ass for a lot of years. Um, I, I went through a lot of like self beat up and guilt and shame. And I, I really made up that there was something wrong with me that I, as much as I wanted to be in relationship, um, I just wasn't cut out for me. And when I turned into that independent woman that didn't need no man, you know, as many women do, we step into that feminist movement. Like, why well, don't be bringing that shit over here. And guys do the same thing. Yeah. Um, I was, I spent 15 years on that place. Uh, and so I need to tell you a little bit of backstory so that you can understand how it is I got over the hurdle. And I have to, I have to take you back to 1976 when I was a 14 year old girl and my sister was getting married. And the reason why this becomes significant is that was the day that for the first time I met my husband. He was 21 and he was showing up to my sister's wedding. He and my brother in law are the best of friends. They have been since mm. fourth grade. Myself as a 14 year old girl had grown really, really weary of all the chaos that was going on inside in preparation for this wedding. And I found myself sitting on the front porch of my home, just kind of taking in some sunshine and wanting to catch a breath of fresh air. When across the street, out of the car, jumped boo, 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 four guys. And there was one in particular that I saw and locked eyes with and went, Oh, man, I want to meet a man like that someday. And I had no basis for this. It was it was completely spontaneous. I didn't know what relationships were. I was a very naive, you know, <laughs> girl about love and life and relationships at that point in time. Um, but I, I kind of stalked him throughout the day, you know, and I'd make sure that we were kind of like sitting close and I'd watch what he would do. And we never did formally meet, but okay. through the rest of my life, this had been like an earmark or, you know, as we mark a page of an experience, that was always something that kind of came with me. And so, as you know, I, um, and I've shared three years later, I found myself pregnant. Um, and a lot of that was because of naivety, um, not being able to talk about it. I just want to okay. say that. Um, because that wasn't allowed in my family. And so I, I had a girlfriend tell me, hey, you just need to douche after you have sex. And that's it. You'll be fine. <laughs> we both got pregnant in the same year. That's what's hilarious about that. Ooh. Right. So, OK, um, fast forwarding as I was going through my journey, I literally have journal pages about I wish I could meet somebody like Tom through my 20s and my 30s. Um, so now I'm 47. And I'm, I'm really making good on my promise to be an independent woman. I've, I've pretty much raised my six kids. I have a business. Life is doing great. Um, I have everything that I need. And I got a phone call from that same brother-in-law saying, hey, Stace, 
uh, you don't know my friend Tom, who I'd been stalking through. And every time that would be said, my antennas would go up like, Tom, Tom, tell me about Tom. And I knew Tom had gotten married and started a sub shop and lived in California. And I knew a lot about Tom just through osmosis of this relationship. Yeah. And he called me one day and said, hey, you don't know my my friend Tom who lives in California. I'm thinking to myself, the hell I don't. You know, like I've been secretly, you know, <laughs> stalking him in the back for years. But OK, tell me what's up. And he says, I want to give him your phone number. I think you could really help him grow his business. Um, he would like to, to grow it in the state. And I can't think of anybody better to hook him up with than you. And the reason why this is significant is because I am certain that if I had not had that experience as a young girl in 1976, there isn't anything else that would have stopped me dead in my tracks and helped me reconsider how it is I'm moving forward in my relationships intimately. Mm. That was the moment where I was like, wow, okay, so I get to actually have a conversation with this person that I have secretly had a crush on for 35 years? Really? okay, bring it on. And even then, I wasn't sure that we would turn into anything, honestly. Yeah. Um, that all unfolded over time. But it was when we were in a relationship, and it was growing. And it came that moment where, okay, you know, it's coming, right? You know, what are we? What are we going to do with this? And I'm like, shit, shit, shit. I don't know. God, how am I going to handle this? I am not getting married again. I told him that on our, our third call. I just want you to know, I'm not interested in married, not going down that road. And he's like, hey, hey, that's fine. You know, I've been married. No problem. We're not going to have kids. Um, I said, okay, okay, we'll continue. Um, that would have been a deal breaker right out of the gate, but he handled it really well. Um, so here we are in the middle of the night, I'm sitting downstairs in my basement, having a conversation with him at midnight, you know, I'm in Utah, he's in Sacramento, we, we're navigating this long distance relationship. And he says, so oh, Stace, what are we? And I went, oh, yeah. and I threw out this idea, how about a lease option contract for love? That's all I could do. Right. I mean, and, 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 and that's all I could give. And we laughed for a minute. And I really just threw it out there to kind of like break the tension. Right. And I was so yeah. uncomfortable because I wanted to go forward. I just didn't know how. And then he, he was actually the brainchild here and said, you know, Stace, that's a really great idea. Why don't you get, why don't you write it up? Let's go. And so we created our first lease option contract for love. And, and I could get it all in for 30 days because I had an out right? Okay, I can get all in and, and we can talk about what we want and what we need and what makes us happy. And, and, you know, we can practice some skills because, you know, I was already studying some of that stuff. And let's just see what happens 30 days from now. Um, 30 days as we were doing evaluations around this contract, um, we did a 90 day. And then from there, I had this like, poof, huge aha moment. And that was the moment where I went, you know what? It's not commitment we're afraid of as human beings when it comes to love and relationships. It's not. It's the easiest thing we do. What we're afraid of is navigating the inevitable ups and downs that we know are coming, especially in round two, three, five, ten, right? We're like, oh, my gosh. That's what terrifies us. Yeah. And so once I realized that I had the ability to do that, I wasn't afraid anymore. And in 2012, we ended up getting married. We've been together 11 years now. So, mm, yeah. That's a great story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's what prompted us to kind of take this online. And, and then I, I really doubled down um, in just a lot of the skills and frameworks that we teach. So I don't want you to think of me as therapy. I want you to think of me as a place where you get to come and learn about relationships and about the skills necessary to navigate your way through anything. You know, as that old saying goes, I want to teach you how to fish. I don't want you to need me. And I also yeah. want you to see the beautiful um, truth in the story is that there's nothing wrong with us, right? That we're not broken. We, we know how to love. We just need to be taught how to do it exactly. in a way that works. That's all. Yeah. So did he have some input uh, into the the podcast and the, the books and everything else that you, that y'all doing today? Tom loves to call himself um, the guide on the side. He says, Stacy's the sage from the stage, and I'm the guide from the side. And in answer to your question, absolutely. Um, 
he we bounce um, frameworks and ideas off of each other. And and really, um, we we teach and create these things that we develop for our own relationship. So mm -hmm. we are living what it is we teach and mm -hmm. we're constantly tweaking it and refining it in our own relationship because we have lots of places to practice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and when we find something that works, we roll it out to our clients and and then we add it into our, many of our programs that we mm -hmm. that we teach and work online. Um, in addition to our book coming out, if I may, we're, we're really wanting, and if your listeners have any insight on this or, or you too, Sharp, I would love for you to tell me what you think might need, you need to make the journey of relationships successful. And when I talk about that, I want you to think about it from the, the place of fun and from the place of joy. And there's a, there's a concept here that I just want to point us to that if we get our needs met in relationships and we know how to put our problems on the shelf and have a good time, we're going to want to stick around because yeah. the reality is nobody wants their relationship to end. That's no. it's hard, right? No, so I don't. <laughs> yeah. And we all do the very best we know how. And so we're adding some products coming up here too, once the book is launched to just help people put their problems on the shelf and go and have fun. So what comes to your mind when you think of that? We're currently in the process of just tell us, reach out and tell me because I would love for you to tell me what that would be um, or what you think would make the journey easier sometimes when we feel like we're shutting down, giving up. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah. So how, but initially, how did y'all, how did you and your husband know that y'all could help other people? Well, um, I was I, I started studying um, therapy back in 1996, oh. and ironically, through this whole journey, you know, I'm I'm kind of weaving in and out of that by helping people, not necessarily relationally, but I started to have this realization that everything comes back to relationships. I didn't know that on the exactly. front side. Exactly. Every, it all comes back to relationships, yep. really. And I used to get so pissed when people would say, "Well, stay." So you know, when it comes to love, all you got to do is love yourself, and I'd go. Ugh! but I don't, I, exactly. I, oh, I just wanted to throw a huge fit. And how do you do that? Oh, you know, you'll figure it out. It's fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Mad. I, I hate get, that. I hate that too. And the other one I hate is tell me how that makes you feel. Oh, uh, that's terrible. I don't, I don't know. I'm not spending any time there. So now what do I do? Am I just sunk? You know, do I just have to toss the whole idea out of being in healthier, thriving relationships? And I, yeah. I just want to say, no, absolutely not. We, yeah. we should learn this stuff in third grade so that we understand it's normal for us to have an emotional body and a physical body. The, and yeah. then, and then that's our navigation system, and and we've never been taught how to use the darn thing, and so we end up, you know, really, really smart and thinking it's got to be completely logical, or we're drowning in our emotions and we don't know how to turn it off. And those are great examples of just being out of balance, but we have the capacity to do both. Yeah, yeah. You know? So how did y'all? How did y'all come up with the uh, concept of the love shack? Well, first of all, I've always loved the V52 song. <laughs> um, and when it came down to it, um, it gives a sense and an experience of it's fun. It's light. I think so much of the time when we talk about relationships, like we're going to talk about relationships today. And we all go, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> mm. Nobody move. <laughs> um, I wanted to bring this idea of it doesn't have to be like that. Right. It, it can be an enjoyable experience. I mean, otherwise, why would we do it? Why do we want it? Why do we seek it? Um, and so I wanted Love Shack to be a place where we could all get together and gather. I love to do that anyway, and have conversations about love and relationships and sex. And I want to have the relationships that are uncomfortable too, because those are the ones that teach us the most. We have to go there. Right. We we need to go there. And um, as you had said in my introduction, and, and thank you so much for that. Marriage is dead is the name of my book, not because I'm anti marriage, yeah. but because we need more than marriage. And so we've got to talk about the pitfalls of marriage and we've got to tell the truth about, you know, a lot of people who eke out a long lasting relationship are not happy and are not thriving. And if you look at the numbers and if you look at the data and the research, statistically, 
that is the case. More than 80% of people who have been married 20 plus years are miserable in their relationship and living separate lives. Nobody wants to talk about that. Don't uncover that. Don't go there. You know, well, wouldn't you want to know why? And if, if I did understand why, wouldn't that help me become better at this? Yeah. And, and wouldn't it be lovely to not, buy into the idea and the myth that marriage is going to guarantee me that this is going to go well. Yeah. I, a lot of people are trying to model exactly what their parents did or what their grandparents did. And I always say, I said, look, I'm not like my parents, <laughs> not even 50%. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, look, I'm not like my dad. My dad was better than me. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, look, if I could be at least 50% of my parents, I'd be happy with that. Wow. Like, so it's just a different, people are different today and it's a different time. It's a different environment. Now, of course, I take certain things from certain principles from my parents and my grandparents and some of it works, some of it doesn't. But to say that I'm going to model everything that my parents did, oh, that's not going to work <laughs> today. Yeah, it's, it's so of brilliant not, of you. It's just not going to work. I I totally agree, and and we don't take into account this idea of evolution, right? That um, of course it's going to be different, right? It's always going to be different, and and more importantly, you know what makes us feel solid and whole as a human being is to validate who I am, right, and not try and be like somebody else. One of my favorite quotes from Leo Biscaglia is, um, be yourself. Everybody else is taken. <laughs> you know, it's like, like everybody, somebody else is always doing that. If you're going to try and be like somebody else, well, then you're a copycat and you're never going to be as good as the original. So, you know, stop it. Don't, don't, don't do that to yourself. Right. And, and another one, speaking of Leo, who I, I just love is unfortunately passed on now, but was, has been a huge significant impact in my life and the work that I do is he um, says eloquently, most of us are strangers to ourselves, asking other strangers who are strangers to themselves to love us. Yeah. Right? And so then relationships take on this very insecure place where I need you to love me because I can't love myself or because I can't find a foundation with inside of me. And that was me for a really long time, quite honestly. Yeah. Um, and until we learn that principle, like you just said, it's important for us to find a sense or a place of this is me. This is me. This is who I am. And it's going to be different than everybody, including my parents. Um, on that note, though, we, we do only know as human beings what we've been taught until we know yeah. better. So yeah. we will do what we know until we learn to do something different. Even if we know it doesn't work. Right. Yeah. Even if we know it doesn't work, if I don't know what else to do, I will keep doing that thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why the skills and the and the practice and all of that, just to expand our paradigms and our thinking is so, so, so important and valuable to us as humans. Yeah. So tell the listeners, um, when does the book come out and what it's all about? Oh, I'd love to. It comes out on my birthday, March 30th. I uh, thought that would be appropriate. Um, the book is about, it starts off as an exploration of marriage and all the different paradigms and history of marriage and where it comes from, um, dating back to the 10th century. It's fascinating because we start to go, hmm, why? And now I'm starting to see and understand why I have the views and the beliefs that I have about marriage. And, and then that's a, a pivotal moment because then we can start to examine it in regards to what works and what doesn't work for me. And again, I'm, I'm not anti-marriage. I'm not. Um, but I think it's important for us to understand why it is we insist on driving ourselves into these places that maybe really aren't us, right? And, and if I don't rely on marriage to be that guarantee, what else can I do to ensure lasting love and relationships? Because marriage isn't going to do it for you. You know, I'm here to tell you there are thousands or tens of thousands, if not millions of people who've tried, tried that path, right? But that's, again, what I just said, we do what we know, even though we know it doesn't work, because I don't know what else to do. So we've got to explore, okay, 
Now what are we going to do? And the book takes us on a journey of sharing my story, but also teaching just some foundational principles about relationships and what they are and how to navigate them with some exercises at the end of the book I call emotional weightlifting. Like we got to get better at this. We got to get strong here. We got to condition ourselves. And so there's some exercises in a, at the end of every chapter so that you can, you know, do an emotional push up. Just, just try. Um, so I intend it to be a story of hope that regardless of where you are in the relationship journey, you come to this realization that there's no such thing as a failed relationship because every relationship that you have ever been in or ever will be in is contributing to who you are and who you're becoming. And that's the mm. whole point. That's the whole point. So we can have love for a lifetime. We all can. We just need to know how to take what works and, and learn from what didn't, right? Realize that we created it in the beginning. So those things we miss, we can bring forward and take with us. And then we go again, because I know if you go again, you're going to get better at this thing we call love. We all have the capacity to be great lovers. And that's my flag. And that's my point of view. And that's my opinion. And I'm going to stick to it. I'm pretty firm on that one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So where would people go to follow you and to get the book when it comes out in March and everything? Well, the easiest place to go to learn all the many things that we offer in a way of serving is my website. And that's stacybartley.com. On that page, um, you'll You'll see our show, you'll see some free workshops and classes, you'll learn a lot more about me, probably more than you ever want to know. And, um, and then the book will be coming out on Amazon exclusive for, for the first um, several months. So that's where you can find the book. But we'll also have a link to that on our website as well. There you have it. Like, share this episode. All links will be found in the show notes. I'm so happy you came on. You know, oh, maybe we too. can do this again some other time. <laughs> I would love, love, love to yeah. anytime, Sharp. It's been <laughs> truly a delightful experience yeah. to share my story. And um, I, I look forward to learning more about you, too. Sure. So um, tell me what you think below. Until next time, we out. Peace.